Do you know the most fabulous gluten-free desserts can likely be made with what you already have in your pantry? On today's show, we're baking three enticing recipes with ingredients that just happen to be naturally gluten-free. Lemon cornmeal cake, spiced pumpkin pie with a crisp rice crust, and flourless chocolate walnut torte. All today on Martha Bakes. Finely ground cornmeal is what gives this delicious lemon cornmeal cake its texture. I wanted to start the recipe by just showing you what mise en place is. It means put in place. We have everything that we need here and here. So you see how organized a baking process can be. It won't be that organized in your house because this is for television, but you have to know that you have all the ingredients for a recipe within easy reach before you start. So now for the recipe. This is based on an Italian style cornmeal torte and it's enriched with the ground almonds and made more flavorful with extra virgin olive oil in place of butter. And best of all, this is naturally gluten free. So start with your milk, half a cup of whole milk and we're going to acidulate the milk. We're going to make it almost like a buttermilk by adding the juice of one lemon. And you can just squeeze the lemon, which by the way, has already been zested because we need the zest of the lemon also for the cake. So just squeeze all the juice out of the lemon. And this is such a great tool to have in your kitchen, this lemon squeezer there. Now you'll see right now it's still just kind of lemony milk but this will thicken up and you'll see what happens. It, it turns like it curdles like a buttermilk. And we need three quarters of a cup of olive oil and I will measure this out. Good, good quality olive oil. And in our food processor, one and a half cups of already ground almonds. They're not fine enough though. And one cup of sugar. Grind this until it's a very fine meal. And these are raw almonds. We're basically making a nice sugary flour of almonds. And to this, now add your lemon zest. Pulsing the almonds and the sugar with the lemon zest allows the lemon to be completely incorporated into the flour of the cake flour in quotes, because we're used to thinking about flour as all-purpose white flour, of course. So now you can dump this into a large bowl. It's very fragrant and very delicious. So to the almond flour, now add your cornmeal, one cup of fresh Italian ground corn. This is made from dried corn kernels. Look how beautifully yellow it is. And don't use coarse grits. Uh, that would not be appropriate for this cake. It has to be a nice fine grind of corn. And to this we add a half a teaspoon of baking soda, one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, and a half a teaspoon of salt. So there's our dried ingredients, well mixed, gluten free. And now we can add to our milk and look how it's curdled. Can you see it's really thick? A nice light buttermilk. Add one teaspoon of almond extract and three large eggs. You can beat these in after each addition. Almond extract is made by combining almond oil from bitter almonds with ethyl alcohol. So it's very, very strong and one teaspoon is plenty. Sometimes people use too much of the extracts and really overpowers the flavor of the other ingredients. So be careful. I have made that mistake. And now add your olive oil to the egg mixture. Look at that gorgeous color. You should have your pan, which is a nine inch spring form pan, 
oiled generously with olive oil. And this has an easy release. You see this little clamp on the side so that when the cake is done, you just separate this ring and the cake will pop out. So now you can add the wet ingredients and you can sort of feel the crunch of the cornmeal. If you want the most nutritious and flavorful cornmeal, make sure the package says whole grain or stone ground. This means that the germ and the bran layer are included in the mix. And your oven should be preheated to 325 degrees. And you're gonna bake this cake for anywhere from 50 to 55 minutes. So just pour this right into your pan and it's ready to go into the oven. Set your timer. So here's the cake. This is what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. Let it cool completely on a wire rack like this in the pan and run a knife around the perimeter so that you're sure it's going to release. Now here is the little clamp that spring form pans have. This releases the ring. Did you notice it got bigger? And this will lift right off. How good. So use a large spatula if you have one, just to lift the cake and put in place. You could use a stencil if you want to put a decoration on there, but it's also very pretty, just powder sugar in a sieve all over the top. It's so pretty. And this is ready to serve. What a nice crumb this cake has. It's moist, bursting with the flavor of lemon. Enjoy. Our test kitchen was really excited with the outcome of this recipe for gluten-free spiced pumpkin pie with a crisp rice crust. It all began with the creative use of a crunchy rice cereal combined with a mixture of butter, brown sugar, and almonds. And that crust is just pressed into a, a pie plate and it looks just like a crumb crust. So it's very easy to make three cups of gluten-free rice cereal. And it says it right on the box, gluten-free. A quarter of a cup plus a tablespoon of light brown sugar. A half a cup of almonds. They can be raw almonds that are sliced or whole. Either will work. And a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. And butter, five tablespoons of butter, which I'll add, I'm gonna grind this up a little bit first. Just to when you're grinding almonds or any kind of nuts, make sure that your blade of your food processor is sharp. And now add your butter, five tablespoons of melted butter. So that looks good. And now this can be just dumped right into, I like using glass because I can see if the bottom of the crust is well made, well baked, I should say. And this is a nine inch glass pie plate. And spread this into an even layer, a little thicker on the outside than in the center. And you can use the back of your hand, your fingers, if you'd like. That's how we always used to do it until we found out that pressing with a little metal cup measure works very well and quickly. This can just press your crust into a nice even layer. Look how nice, this works so well. And preheat your oven to 375 degrees. Try to make the sides all equal thickness and just pop this into your oven and make the filling. It takes about 12 minutes. And now for the pumpkin filling, the spicy pumpkin filling, one and a half cups of pumpkin puree. This can be homemade. Of course, it can also be canned. Pumpkin is one of the nicest foods that you can get out of a can three eggs, and whisk the eggs into the pumpkin. It's a custardy filling, very similar to a traditional pumpkin pie. You can also use any number of squashes for this pie too. Instead of pumpkin, you could use 
um, the wonderful butternut squash, acorn squash, kabocha squash. Uh, they all make very nice pie fillings. And three quarters of a cup of light brown sugar, a half a teaspoon of salt, some cornstarch, about a tablespoon will do, just in case your squash is a little wet, a pinch of cloves, and some cinnamon, one teaspoon. Also, my favorite nutmeg, just about a quarter of a teaspoon of nutmeg. So stir this up. Brown sugar gets lumpy and dry really fast, which is why we keep it in a sealed container. And it'll be very hard to break up if it gets too dry. So you can just add this right to your pumpkin. And now add one cup of milk, whole milk. Some people might use cream, but the milk works very nicely. Make sure that your oven is set to 325 degrees. But you can see it's nice and silky smooth. Get this right into your pie crust. This rice crust, which is gluten-free, can be used with a filling of uh, cream, of chiffon or custard. Chocolate is very good. You can experiment, but it's a very nice crust to have on hand when you want to make a delicious pie. There, get that right into your oven. It's going to take about 50 to 55 minutes. So for the topping for this delicious pumpkin pie, we're not done. Yogurt, three cups of yogurt, a half a teaspoon of vanilla, and three tablespoons of honey. And this you just dollop right on top. Use a nice thick yogurt, like a Greek style. So just spoon this right on top. You want to just cover the whole pie with your yogurt. Looks so beautiful. And you can just put this back into the fridge to chill a little bit until you're ready to serve. And there you have a spicy, gluten-free pumpkin pie. You can experiment with all sorts of fillings for this unique crust, but this one just might turn out to be your favorite. Enjoy. If you follow a gluten-free diet and crave decadent chocolate desserts, look no further than this flourless chocolate walnut torte. It's a rich cake that calls for walnuts to be used instead of flour and replaces butter with coconut oil for richness. So the first step is to melt the chocolate. Eight ounces of bittersweet chocolate. I just melt it in a bowl over simmering water. A little bit of a double boiler creation here. And you melt the chocolate with your shortening, which is really, instead of butter, a half a cup of coconut oil. Coconut oil looks like lard or vegetable shortening. It's solid in form. It's often used as a butter substitute in vegan and dairy-free baking. It's unrefined. It imparts a sweet, fragrant flavor to baked goods made with chocolate. And look for it sold in jars and be sure it says virgin. Very important. Or if it doesn't say virgin, it should say unrefined on the label. Let that just soften and melt together. In the food processor, Take a half a cup of walnut meat and grind them until they are quite fine, almost like a flour. And I'm using what's known to all nut aficionados as English walnuts. They originally came from Persia. It has that hard, thick shell, actually two shells, sort of clamped together. And uh, this looks very nice quite fine, and prepare your pan. The pan should be brushed with coconut oil also. This is an eight inch by two inch cake pan. Now I've cut a piece of parchment that will fit nicely right into the bottom. You can do your own parchment liners. You can also buy them in some cake decorating stores. Now, because we want the cake to look dark, on the sides, on the top, on the bottom. The secret 
instead of using flour for release, use cocoa. And just sift some cocoa into the pan and then sort of bang it around. It's gonna stick all over the coconut oil. And I have a piece of parchment on my counter to collect the excess cocoa. There, it's beautiful. But do shake out the excess. And there, look how nice your pan looks. Here we have our walnuts ground. How is our chocolate doing? It's melted. We can take it off the heat. Just remove it from the steaming water. And now you can add your sugar, one and a quarter cups of granulated sugar, half a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of vanilla, stir in your walnuts, and Dutch processed cocoa, a quarter of a cup. And now you can add your eggs one by one. You have to make sure that the chocolate is cool enough so that it doesn't cook your eggs. So this looks so good, so shiny. And now pour your batter right into your prepared pan. Make sure your oven is preheated to 350 degrees. And just shake it around, get it level right into the oven for 35 minutes. So here's your cake. It's best if you let this cool in the pan overnight. Run a knife around the perimeter like this, just to make sure that it will come out of the pan. And then you can turn it out onto your serving plate. And we can do that by inverting like this. Oh, I heard it plop. That's a good sign. And here's this beautiful cake. We're not going to ice the sides of the cake, just the top with a ganache. About a third of a cup of semi-sweet chocolate melted with one teaspoon of coconut oil. Just let that melt together. And you can decorate with chopped walnuts or whole walnut halves if you have some. You want the glaze to be nice and smooth. And you can just put that right in the middle of your cake. Just a little bit of icing. Spread it just to cover almost the entire top. This will level out. You can sprinkle the chopped walnuts around the edge. This cake can be made with bittersweet chocolate or semi-sweet chocolate. Either chocolate will work very nicely. I just happen to like the semi-sweet. And if you want, you can put some walnut halves also on your cake. What a beautiful cake. Cut it into wedges and serve. You can keep this refrigerated covered for up to a day. It's so rich and so tasty. You can hardly believe that it is gluten and dairy free eaten right away, it's divine, but if you serve it chilled, it is even fudgier. Calling all pie and tart and galette bakers. If you're looking for a healthier, more nutritious crust alternative for your next recipe, today's show is just for you. Using a new repertoire of grains, flours, and sweeteners, I'll share three exciting new recipes. A plum galette with cornmeal crust, a chocolate coconut pie, and a mushroom tart. All today on Martha Bakes. For the novice baker, a galette, which is pie's freeform cousin, uh, will give you the confidence you need before trying actual pies and tarts. For added crunch and flavor in the crust, I'm using cornmeal in this mouth-watering plum galette. And the crust is very easy to make and use your trusted food processor, one cup of all-purpose flour, and we're adding a quarter cup of this extraordinary cornmeal given to me by my friend, Jack Alger. So um, it's gonna have a fabulous taste. A half a teaspoon of salt, a tablespoon of granulated sugar, and that's basically the dry ingredients. Cold butter, like all pie crusts, make it cold, bake it hot. Remember that. So everything should be cold. 
I'm just basically sifting the dry ingredients together by pulsing. Add your butter. And this is one stick of butter cut into small cubes. And this gets processed right into the dry ingredients by pulsing. And you want to leave a little bit of butter visible. I always say it should look like coarse oatmeal. And that there, it's pretty much that. And then we add two tablespoons of ice water mixed with one large egg yolk. So separate your egg yolk from the white. Save the white. I love to save it in a plastic container like this, and I just keep adding egg whites and writing on the cover what it is. So that can be used for angel food cake or something else. And two tablespoons of iced water. No ice cubes. If you get an ice cube in your pastry, it will make a wet spot. And that wet spot will make a hole. And you will not have a beautiful crust there. And so just pour this liquid down the feed tube while pulsing. That looks just right just starting to come together. And if you put it in your hand, it stops crumbling. That's exactly what we want. And this gets wrapped up in plastic wrap, and that will be your crust. And now, if you gather your pastry into this plastic wrap, make it into a flat disc, and then Basically, flatten it out and chill for at least an hour and up to overnight. Now for the filling, we have one and a quarter pounds of plums. Your plums go into just a small amount of sugar, a quarter of a cup of sugar, and also add a little bit of cornstarch. The cornstarch will thicken the juices of these juicy plums that's two tablespoons of cornstarch. Let them sit for a little while. Oh, and don't forget vanilla. Split the vanilla bean down its length and scrape with the flat side of the knife. Those are millions and millions of little vanilla bean seeds. And this goes right into your bowl with your plums. Stir these up. Mm, they smell very good. So now we're actually ready to roll out our galette crust. This one we want to be about 12 inches in diameter. A few little cracks. Now if you're making it very rustic, you can just leave the free form edge. If you want it to be a little bit more formal, you can cut around the edge with a pastry wheel. But notice how easy it is to pick up if you roll it on your pin like this and then how easy it is to unroll right on your parchment covered baking sheet. There. And this is the crust for our galette. Put your plums right in the center. It would be a very good idea to have lots of those crusts in your freezer for summertime, because who knows when you're going to be at the farmer's market or even a good grocery store and find the perfect plums so that you too can make a bottom crust galette. Use all that nice juice and then make sure your hands are clean before you start to fold up the edge over the fruit. You can, as I say, do it in a rustic fashion like this. You can pleat it, you can Fold it over nicely. Ah, oh, this is so great. Rustic version. You can use a little bit of turbinado sugar on the top of the fruit. Dot with small pieces of butter on the fruit itself. That will flavor the juiciness of these beautiful plums. One or two tablespoons will do. And this will go right into the refrigerator to chill for approximately an hour before you put it into the oven. And here is our chilled version. 
and one large egg mixed with one teaspoon of water. This is your glaze. And just brush just on the pastry. Your oven is preheated to 375 degrees and this will take approximately 35 minutes or so or 40 minutes to bake at that temperature. A galette is such an easy version of a fruit pie. A little bit of that sugar on the crust. And there you have a spectacular galette ready to go into the oven. So the galette has been placed on a flat surface. I like it right on the parchment because it's the only way really that you can lift it off the tray and then serve these lovely wedges with either whipped cream, creme fraiche, or even a scoop of buttermilk sorbet. Enjoy. Soft peaks of marshmallowy Italian meringue and silky chocolate ganache. Fill a graham cracker crust for a sinfully delicious chocolate coconut pie. So to make a crust, pulse in the bowl of a food processor, 12 dairy-free graham crackers, six and a half ounces. Break them up a little bit before you try to grind them. It's hard to grind whole graham crackers. They grind up very nicely if you pulse a little bit. That's good. Now add the rest of the ingredients. Instead of butter, we are adding a quarter of a cup of virgin coconut oil, which is pressed from raw coconut. It's often used as a butter substitute for people who are vegan or desirous of dairy-free baking. It's as rich as butter without the cholesterol, and it is as versatile as vegetable oil. With the coconut oil, we add a quarter of a teaspoon of coarse salt, three tablespoons of granulated sugar, and two tablespoons of cold water. And that's pretty much it for the crust. Process this, and it should all kind of come together into a moist mass. So just transfer this to a nine inch pie dish, and I prefer using a glass pie dish for this. It allows you to see the bottom of the crust while baking so that you know that it is done. So evenly spread this. I do this quickly with a rubber spatula like this, and then I press with the bottom of a cup measure. So now watch, this is the secret for getting it nice and flat and even. And notice how I'm pushing into the corners of the bottom, holding the top firm with my finger, and try to get it right up to the top of the rim. But look how pretty it is, and how quick and easy. Right into a 350 degree oven, and we will pre-bake or blind bake, which means to bake a crust before you fill it. Bake for 12 to 14 minutes. So our crust has baked, and cooled, and we're ready to fill it with a most delectable chocolate ganache and a meringue topping. Eight ounces of unsweetened chocolate. It's pure chocolate without any added sugar, and it is used pretty much exclusively for baking. You would not want to just chew on a piece of this because it's pretty bitter. <laughs> and you have to chop the chocolate into small pieces, and in a saucepan, while you're chopping, heat a 14 ounce can of unsweetened coconut milk and pour this over the chocolate. The hot coconut milk carefully and gradually melts the pure bitter chocolate. You can stir, and it takes a while for all the lumps to disappear. We have a swap out right here. You can see how silken smooth it becomes. So I will use this one and start whipping two egg whites with a half a teaspoon of vanilla. Do this on sort of low just to break up the egg whites while you heat a half a cup of sugar with a quarter of a cup of water. You want to make a sugar syrup and to keep it crystalline free, you can use a brush with a little bit of water just 
to go around the top of your pan. So turn this on high and bring it to a boil. Use a candy thermometer and you'll want to heat it to softball temperature at 238 on a candy thermometer. And guess what? We're at softball stage. You can turn off the heat, remove your thermometer, and for easy cleanup, here's another hint. Just put the thermometer into some water to dissolve the sugar. And now slowly pour the sugar syrup right into the egg whites. Just whisk until it's nice and stiff and cool. Important to be cool before you add it to the chocolate. So here we are, stiff and silky. And so now transfer your chocolate into the meringue and fold it in. This lightens the chocolate. It increases its volume. It sweetens it and makes a wonderful filling. And who would have guessed that you would get so much? And now just pour this into your crust. And this has to be refrigerated for at least an hour and preferably for up to a day. So I would suggest if you're having a dinner party tomorrow night, you make it in the morning or tonight for tomorrow night. That is such a beautiful pie. Get that right into the fridge and chill. So here is your chilled chocolate coconut pie. It does look so beautiful. And some chocolate curls could be scattered here and there. I think more the merrier. These are bittersweet chocolate and they make very nice curls. And you can also use chocolate nibs and these are the unsweetened bits of fermented cocoa bean. Consider them to be new chocolate chips. They're not sweet, but they are packed with intense chocolate flavor. In fact, for me, it's just a little too intense, but you might prefer them to the chocolate curls. But whichever you prefer, this is a spectacular dessert, and your guests will be surprised that it's dairy-free. Whole wheat flour and olive oil, rather than butter or shortening, form the crust of this delicious savory mushroom tart that has a flavor made all the more complex with the addition of tahini, a roasted sesame paste. So you are using three quarters of a cup of all-purpose unbleached flour, and we're using three quarters of a cup of whole wheat flour. Mix those together with one teaspoon of salt. And remember, salt isn't so much to make things salty, but salt is added to bring out all the flavors. And into this, three tablespoons of olive oil. So this is a very different kind of crust. And use a rubber scraper to stir. And our secret ingredient, a quarter of a cup of tahini. Now tahini comes from the Arabic word tahana, meaning to grind. And this is a protein packed condiment, which is made out of ground up sesame seeds. It's very good. And we need three tablespoons of ice water without any ice. So three tablespoons just sprinkled over the dry ingredients. This is great. So now just put this out on a piece of parchment paper and try to gather it into a single mass. And you can roll it between two pieces of parchment paper. We want it to fit into our nine inch removable bottom tart pan. So now you can roll this up on your rolling pin. And like all my crusts, I either pull off the excess with my thumb, pressing into the fluting of the ring, or you can take your rolling pin and roll right across the top. Now, before you put it in your preheated 425 degree oven, dock it, meaning you're adding little holes 
which will prevent the crust from erupting during baking. And you should get a nice flat crust out of this. Bake the crust at 425 for 35 to 40 minutes. Our crust came out beautifully. Look how great it looks. It's a little bit smaller than the pan. It does shrink a little bit. I have my oil heating. Add a half a cup of finely minced shallots and one clove of garlic, finely minced. We just want to sweat them a little bit. These are called aromatics. Beautiful. With a half a teaspoon of salt and a little bit of red pepper flakes. Just a little. Stir those around just until the shallots are translucent. So now the mushrooms. We have one pound of wild mushrooms. Cremini, oyster mushrooms. If you can find portobello, that would be nice. Add them to the pot. And continue to stir them and cook until tender and golden brown. We have a swap out. So after eight to 10 minutes, we're going to add two eggs, slightly beaten, quarter of a cup of parsley, finely chopped. I like to use just the leaves of the Italian parsley for this. So beautiful. And three quarters of a cup of Gruyere cheese grated. So this all gets added to the mushrooms. And your Gruyere. And what a simple, nice filling. And this goes right into your crust. Layer your mixture right in the crust. Mm, how special this is. This is a wonderful lunch dish. It is a fantastic first course for a dinner of a leg of lamb or a fish. And it could also be a vegetable course. So there. Now this goes onto a rimmed baking sheet. Put it right back into the oven, 350 degrees, 30 to 35 minutes. Well, here's the tart, still slightly warm. Perfect temperature for serving. Be careful not to let the ring burn your arm. That has happened. Doesn't that look good? And you can garnish with pretty parsley leaves. The green looks beautiful on this tart. And it also adds a nice flavor. There, I think that's enough. And then the salad. Oh, just a wonderful mixed green salad, fresh garden lettuces with a sherry vinaigrette. And this should be dressed right before serving. And the dressing does take better on the salad if the salad is not wet. So use your salad spinner and let's see how this cuts. And a generous size for a luncheon course. Look how great. A fresh green salad, a glass of white wine, a wedge of mushroom tart. What could be better for a lunch shared with friends? Through experimentation with a new repertoire of ingredients, we've had spectacular success transforming, if not elevating, some vintage cake recipes. Today, I'll make three old-fashioned favorites that are just as delicious as they are wholesome. Oat roulade with berry cream, chocolate buckwheat torch, zucchini almond cake. All today on Martha Bakes. Leaving the oats unsifted is the key to this roulade's pleasingly rustic texture. One of the easiest flours to mill at home is oat flour. You can grind it right up from whole grain rolled oats that you can simply pulse in a food processor until finely ground. This will not be the same as fresh milled oats from the grist mill, but they're tasty. They have a mild flavor that works into a variety of baked goods like pancakes, muffins, and the old-fashioned jelly roll that I'm going to show you how to make today. A pinch of salt into one cup of the oats and just grind these up until they're very fine. Just make sure that you keep the little blade that's in here very sharp. So a quarter of a cup of this flour should be sprinkled lightly over the parchment paper that has been buttered. First butter the pan, then put in a piece of parchment paper and butter the whole thing. 
this is going to be a little bit of a crust on your roulade. And this is the typical jelly roll pan, 11 by 17. This will adhere to the butter. And shake it around a little bit just to get over the entire surface there. Done. So now to make the cake itself, we have to separate four eggs large, put the yolks in this bowl and the whites in this bowl. Break them up first and then mix with a quarter of a cup of sugar. It's gonna take about three minutes to get this into a nice meringue. And this type of cake, by the way, is leavened only by the air beaten into both the whites and then into the yolks. Let that get nice and frothy and about tripled in volume. Oh, these look beautiful. Stiff peaks, glossy. That's exactly what we are looking for. So now remove this bowl and you can now beat the egg yolks. And once the egg yolks are broken up, add a quarter of a cup of sugar slowly and beat the yolks until they're nice and light and fluffy. Now this is ready to incorporate right into your egg whites, along with your ground oats and ultimately four tablespoons of cooled melted butter. So pour this into your egg whites and try, if you have it, the largest of your rubber scrapers. So fold these, it looks so beautiful. It looks like a lemon custard. And now sprinkle your ground oats right over your fluffy egg whites and egg yolks. And you're mixing, but you're trying not to deflate. And then your butter. So what did grandma do without electric mixers and without food processors? So here, pull your batter into your pan. You're going to spread it evenly in one nice layer and preheat your oven to 350 degrees. You'll rotate the pan halfway through the baking time. The whole time is about 15 minutes. So now this is what the cake looks like, warm right out of the oven, sprinkled generously with powdered sugar. Run the sugar through a sieve as I'm doing so that it's nice and fine. And I always love the flavor of the confectioner's sugar on a roll like this. And now we are going to turn this out onto a towel. You can hold the towel taut, flip it over. You have to do that fast because you want to get that cake out of the pan. There, oh, thank goodness it came out. So now take it off your parchment. It's very thin cake. And powder again with sugar. The sugar is getting stuck in the sieve. Just use your fingertips as I'm doing to push it through. And to make a nice plump cake, roll from the short side. Fold the edge of the towel over and just roll the cake. You'll unroll it when it's cool enough so that you can put the cream inside. So I've whipped one cup of heavy cream and now just about a quarter of a cup of berry jam. Fold it in and this is your filling. A little streaky is good. So now unroll your cake. This is cooled. And I remember with my mother, we all loved roulades. We always made one right after we made berry jams. So the cream gets spread all over the cake. So beautiful. And then roll it up again. But this time, do not roll the towel into your cake. But use the towel as your guide. Transfer this to a serving platter, dust with some more confectioner sugar, and refrigerate for at least 30 minutes or up to three hours. Then it will slice perfectly. Serve this roulade with lots of berries. I'm sure you'll enjoy it.
A tort refers to a rich cake made with little or no flour. But thanks to the use of gluten-free buckwheat flour and ground almonds, this version has a lighter texture and a wonderful earthy flavor. This is a chocolate buckwheat tort. In this double boiler, well, fabricated double boiler, I have melted one stick of unsalted butter with six ounces of semi-sweet chocolate. So this is ready to go. You can turn the heat off. In your food processor, uh, grind up a quarter of a cup of blanched almonds, which have been lightly toasted. Now this makes a lot of noise, so get it over with. A little bit of texture is okay, but no big lumps. I think that's good enough. Oh, it's a beautiful color and oh, so fragrant. And into your ground nuts, add a third of a cup of buckwheat flour. And if you can find it freshly milled at your local grist mill, even better. So a third of a cup, a quarter of a teaspoon of cinnamon, and a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. Coarse kosher salt, I like the best for baking. And I just want you to know that buckwheat has nothing to do with wheat. That's why this is a gluten-free cake. It's actually a seed from a plant that's related to rhubarb and is therefore classified as a pseudo-grain. This gluten-free flour has a dark grayish-brown color and a distinctively earthy flavor. It's blended with wheat flour or other starches to add another flavor dimension to baked goods. And that's what we're doing here. We're mixing this with the almonds and the chocolate to make a really fantastic torch. So this is all combined. So now I can put my third of a cup of light brown sugar into the mixer, fitted with a wire whisk, by the way. We can break our eggs one at a time and add it to the sugar. I'm doing this just to check the eggs for no other reason. But I know my eggs are generally perfect. Get this well beaten. It'll lighten a little bit and it takes about six minutes for it to get to the appropriate fluffiness. And your pan, this is a springform pan. This should be well buttered, fitted with a piece of parchment in the bottom, and then buttered again. Mm, I think this looks very nice. So lift that up, you can see it's a thick, thick ribbon. So now you can add your chocolate and your flour mixture. Put a spoon or two of the chocolate and and another spoon. And now fold in your flour. And that's it. Pour this right into your prepared pan. Your oven should be preheated to 350 degrees. Rotate the cake halfway through baking. It'll take about 25 minutes. So the cake is baked for 25 minutes. Cool it in the pan for 10 minutes, then release the sides and remove the cake to a rack. Let it cool completely before you uh, put it on your serving platter. And you can put a ganache on top if you like. You can dust the whole thing with powdered sugar. You can dust part of it. I'm putting a little six inch cake round here and I'm just going to dust the edges because you always see things dusted completely and let's try something different. This is acting just as a, a little bit of a guide for the for the sugar. Now very carefully lift this. Pretty. And then put this on your serving platter. Hope that no wind blows because powdered sugar will blow. And if you happen to have a stencil of your initial, you could put your initial, a nice big M in the center. Wouldn't that be pretty? So to serve, I would suggest cutting it into nice sized wedges. Not too big and not too small. Use one of these offset 
serrated knives, which are very good. And serve with a scoop of cinnamon ice cream. Everyone's going to savor this beautiful torte. Enjoy. Gluten-free zucchini almond cake owes its structure to almond flour, while potato starch, which is what I'm sifting right here, lightens the texture and grated zucchini keeps it all moist. For the finishing touch, a homestyle quick to prepare cream cheese frosting, ideal for swirling and swooping. So the process is a little bit more involved than just dump and stir. I'm sifting with my whisk, three quarters of a cup of potato starch, and we need three cups of almond flour and measure that as you would regular flour. Almond flour is also known as almond meal. And all nut flours are known also as meals. And they're finely ground from untoasted nuts. And they can be used to enrich the flavor of baked goods and boost the protein content too. And also avoid the gluten from wheat. And sift that together with the potato starch. And add to these dry ingredients, which are quite moist, by the way, um, a half a teaspoon of salt, two and a half teaspoons of baking powder, replacing some of the flour with potato starch, which is a European technique, tightens the grain and holds the moisture supplied by the eggs and the sugar. Just make sure this is all mixed together. And there it is. Now the eggs. We have six beautiful farm fresh eggs, large. Whisk these a little bit to break up the yolks. And these are in the bowl of a stand mixer. And now to get more volume, put this over a pot of simmering water. We're warming the eggs, which will help get them very foamy, very full and fluffy. You have to stir constantly. You do not want to cook the eggs. This is another way to scramble eggs, if you know it, but we don't want to do that. We just want to warm. Warming relaxes the egg proteins, enabling the eggs to whip up higher and more quickly. And this uh, process also melts the sugar, which I can add right now, one cup of light brown sugar. We want to melt that so that there are no crystals of sugar in our beautiful batter. And this takes about three minutes. Now insert your whisk and beat until the mixture is pale, thick, and cool to the touch. This is gonna take seven, eight minutes. And you can gradually increase the speed to high. Now in the meantime, preheat your oven to 350 degrees. We're using eight inch cake pans that are buttered and then lined with a parchment round in the bottom and then buttered again. So these are two, We're making a two layer cake. And while that's beating, you can grate your zucchini. You're going to need two cups of zucchini grated and put into a cotton towel would be great, or a double piece of cheesecloth would also work. And as the zucchini sits, it becomes more and more watery or moist. And you'll see how much water will come out of the zucchini. You can just twist the towel Zucchinis, yellow squash, they're all very watery. So all that water comes out. So now your zucchini is dry enough to incorporate into your batter. So our mixture is getting there. And while the eggs are beating, add two tablespoons of highest quality vanilla. I think they're nice and light and fluffy, and I'm going to do my typical folding by machine, which is just like that. First the dry, and then the butter, and then the zucchini, and now the butter. This is one stick, eight tablespoons, melted and cooled. And you can sprinkle the zucchini in the top. And that is our batter. And then divide half and half. And for even layers that are perfectly even, you can use a scale or you can just 
guesstimate. Transfer these to the 350 degree preheated oven and halfway through baking, you can rotate the cakes and bake them until they're golden brown and a tester comes out with a little bit of crumb attached. Transfer to a wire rack, let cool completely. So our cakes are done and cooling. Look how pretty they are. I think I'll invert one so you can see how great it is. And it's a lovely cake. And so we're going to make the delicious cream cheese frosting to fill the center of the cake, this layer, and then the top layer. Two sticks of butter, 24 ounces of cream cheese. That's three eight ounce packages of high quality cream cheese. And notice I have fitted the mixer with a flat beater which you need for this weight of butter and cream cheese, and it'll get a nice smooth texture. And confectioner's sugar, one cup. And there's no reason to sift this because this mixer will beat it nice and smooth. Three teaspoons of vanilla extract. And when I say highest quality, I mean pure vanilla extract which is becoming more and more expensive, by the way, because the vanilla orchid from which the beans come are being over-farmed, over-picked. I think that's enough. So just spread a nice thick layer of cream cheese on top of the first layer. And now you can put the next layer on top. If you like, you could actually, with this much frosting, frost the inside, the top, and the sides, or you can just do the inside and the top and serve it as a naked cake. But I think it looks beautiful frosted all over. And just think you'll have a really good recipe for that zucchini in your garden. I hope I've inspired you to rethink your cake recipes, and hopefully you'll come up with some new favorites just like I have. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Martha Bakes.